Okay. Let's go on. Now, this just shows the basic geometry of a lunar occultation. Uh, and I'm, you know, probably have seen this before, but um, you know, mostly in observatories will see a total occultation where the star will disappear and then reappear about an hour later on the other side of the moon. And usually you do these during the waxing phases when the star disappears on the dark side of the moon. Um, but I'm just showing this uh, to show that there's a more interesting geometry that occurs if you happen to be right at the northern or southern limits of the region of visibility of the occultation. And then what you get is a grazing occultation with the path of the star as a tangent line to the moon, uh, moon's disk. And then you get multiple disappearances and reappearances of the star in the mountains and craters along the uh, um, uh, north, near the north or south pole. Um, this just shows one example of uh, grazing occultation reduction where we set up uh, about a dozen observers uh, you know, spread across the path. And this shows plots their distances from the predicted limit line versus the time relative to the time of central occultation. And so you can see how it traces out the lunar profile in uh, great detail. Um, uh, but uh, keep in mind that there's an exaggeration of about 50 to 1 in the vertical direction here. Um, otherwise, you um, you know, lunar topography is really quite gentle, um, you know, but um, um, anyway, there's a long history of uh, double star discoveries from lunar occultations, and, and Terry's was the first, observed in uh, 1819, um, and then um, in 1969, I happened to observe a graze of Antares uh, by the thin crescent moon and uh, on the dark side of the moon. And it was really fantastic to see the red giant star and then the fifth magnitude uh, blue companion contrast, uh, where you could see the blue companion for quite some time. And I managed to record a graze of Antares then with a color video camera from Western Australia in uh, 2009. So I want to show a little bit of a video clip uh, um, of that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Just click. And this uh, was made with a uh, um, uh, five inch telescope. And here's Antares. You know, it's, the telescope's about three years old. It's quite beat up. So the, uh, um, um, the, um, uh, the focus is real good and everything. And we were fighting clouds. We fortunately, we, the, the clouds thinned out right during the occultate grays, and then they clouded up again. Um, and but there we had strong wind. <laughs> no, but um, but it calms down a little bit. Um, there, there you can see the companion. And pretty soon uh, you will see it come out again. Uh, we had a whole sequence of events. Mostly, there were more events of the, pri of the secondary star than of the primary for, uh, for this uh, station. There, there's the uh, secondary star. But, um, here you can see it better. See when the bright side part of the moon there it disappeared, and there are a sequence of events here. Yeah, you can see it a little better. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, let's. Uh, you get the general idea. Let's move on back to the. Um, Okay. So anyway, this shows the predicted profile then generated by the Kaguya data with all the observations. And most of these are the secondary star. This is the primary star. In this particular profile, it's not like the previous one. In this case, the moon's mean limb is a straight line. And so the, for each observer, the, for each component, uh, the, the star's path is a sort of a parabolic arc. Um, that comes down and then back up again. Uh, so uh, you can see the very good detail, the uh, comparison we get with the modern profiles. Um, 
Anyway, IOTA's efforts to catalog possible double stars from lunar occultations. In the early 70s, I worked uh, at the University of Texas on their photoelectric lunar occultation observations, reducing hundreds of their observations. Um, I worked with a student, Don Stockbauer. We created a list of possible double stars from lunar occultations using various sources, I mean, our own observations uh, at Texas, but also you know, grazes and total occultations from published lists. And also, we included in the list spectroscopic <laughs> binaries because we wanted to encourage observations of those from occultations. Um, uh, but, um, and we had codes uh, specifying these things, but too many dubious events were uh, included. We went through all these published uh, lists, and wherever the observers said there was a gradual event, we put a flag in there. Um, but most of those gradual events were more likely to Fresnel diffraction effects rather than um, uh, duplicity. And we had codes that indicated uh, whether there were clear step events or not and different things, but unfortunately those were lost when the uh, data were transferred into the current prediction list, and they even got into the Washington Interferometric Catalog as OCC stars. So uh, unfortunately a lot of those uh, aren't so good, but a lot of them are quite good. Um, anyway, and recently then um, we encourage observers to instead of just observing visually, to use uh, inexpensive video equipment to at least get approximate photometric information. Um, we, um, over, over 90, we encourage observations uh, from past uh, claimed duplicity events, and over 90 percent of those show no evidence of duplicity in the new video observations. So we're slowly getting, you know, sorting those out, and we have some software things that whenever I have some time to do it, we'll get a better situation with this. Um, the, um, if the same lunar occultation is observed from widely separated locations, we can get a unique separation and position angle. But if there's only one observation made, you only, a single observation gives just a single so-called vector separation of the uh, two components in the position angle of the occultation. Um, uh, results are published in GDSO periodically. This just shows uh, one of our first results uh, port, and um, this shows one of the grazing occultations where we've uh, that was videotaped, and you can see the very nice uh, step events with the different components and so forth. Um, and uh, this just shows one of our published uh, lists. Then the top one is uh, um, where we actually have multiple observers, uh, so we are able to get unique disappearance, you know, separation and position angle, and here's where just vector separations were determined. And then we have another table of, uh, um, of claimed double stars from previous observations where the video showed nothing. Um, next, I'll mention professional work uh, that's uh, now mainly coordinated by Andrea Rishishi. Um, he worked for a long time Previously at the European Southern Observatory, he's now in Thailand. Now, most observations are recorded in the infrared, which allows a higher signal-to-noise ratio. Um, observations are you know, usually um, concentrated on times when the moon crosses the galactic central region, obviously high interest, and um, you know, passages through you know, clusters and other interesting things. And also, he's been able to set up the equipment so it can be used by others uh, during so-called dead times between other astronomical observations you know, on the uh, VLT at the uh, European Southern Observatory. And this shows the collaborators. So uh, We hope maybe we'll get some more of you with, uh, um, to, to do this sort of thing with the uh, fast uh, video cameras, uh, or, you know, the Andor cameras and things like that. Um, uh, but. Um, um, you know, a lot of the observations are made at the VLT and uh, at ESO. Uh, so not too many professionals are doing it these days, uh, but uh, we encourage uh, the am well-equipped amateurs to, to try. This shows uh, the 2.4 meter telescope in Thailand that they're just getting going, uh, so Andrea is uh, getting some observations with that now. Uh, and uh, this just shows uh, some of the different techniques uh, that are used uh, by the professionals. Some of them just use CCD drift scanning, like uh, shown here, uh, but uh, uh, more sophisticated arrays and so forth, specialized uh, uh, formats and adaptive optics and so forth. Um, this shows the uh, 
uh, some of the results from the VLT obtained in September 2009 when the, um, this shows uh, just uh, um, areas of the, um, uh, when the moon passed through the uh, central part of the, uh, you can see from the right ascension in 18 hours and declination, so this is in the uh, interesting uh, central galactic region. Um, and um, they use the so-called Isaac instrument, um, 3.2 millisecond time resolutions with uh, 200 events were recorded about in uh, two half nights. <laughs> um, and um, 184, well, let's see, there were 22 binary stars and five triple stars were resolved uh, with those observations. Two angular diameters were measured, and there were several interesting extended or complex sources. Um, just show a couple of examples. Here's an easy binary star where you see the Fresnel diffraction pattern, um, you know, of the two different components, um, you know, clearly resolved. Um, so the separation 41 mil arc seconds. Um, you can see when you have an eight meter aperture, you can get really good <laughs> yeah, signal to noise ratio. Um, and here's an example of a triple star where it's not so obvious, but if you deconvolve the light curve. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you know, back out the uh, intensity uh, function uh, in the vector separate uh, in the position angle, and you can see uh, the primary star two very clear steps. Uh, so they're with quite small separations here. Um, it's within the uh, diffraction. Uh, um, um, you know, you know the, the, the the components are less than the fringe spacing, so that's why uh, you can, don't notice it at first, but when you do the analysis, they show up. And here's an example of an interstellar shell um, with about 16 mil arc seconds across. Um, so that's lunar occultations, but I also want to mention asteroidal occultations. The lunar occultations uh, can be observed at uh, any observatory. You get to f several a night, usually when the, moon, when the sky is clear and the moon is up. Um, uh, but um, um, you know, lunar occul asteroidal occultations are less common, of course, but, but if you are persistent, you can observe uh, you know, maybe 10 of them a year or so uh, from a ob given observatory. Um, the diffraction scale for lunar occultations is about 10 meters at the moon's distance, or about 10 milli arc seconds. Um, the, but for asteroidal occultations, uh, it's about 300 meters at their greater distance of two to three astronomical units or uh, about only about 0.5 mil arc seconds, so about 20 times better than lunar occultations for resolution. Um, the asteroids move much farther from the ecliptic than the moon, so you have a larger range of stars that you can get. Uh, but of course, the asteroids just obtain a very much smaller angular size, so opportunities for specific stars, of course, are very rare. You know, it's interesting, we do have a couple of, uh, we did observe an occultation of Regulus in uh, 2005, and we have another opportunity with it in 2014 when the path uh, of an occultation of Regulus by an, uh, an asteroid, Origany, I think it is, passes over New York City. Um, so anyway, um, a good example of an occultation of a binary star by an asteroid is one by this asteroid Una, so we want to uh, switch to that. Uh, <coughs> There we go. The star is in the middle. Watch it closely. See it stepped down, and there now it's down. At, so you're just seeing the asteroid now, and now it's stepping up uh, with the components. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let it go. He, well, oh, it does it again. Yeah, oh, it does it again. That's okay. all right. Oh. Anyway, well, just do it. Just do it one, one more time, so you can. Uh, He's using an image intensifier on a 16-inch telescope, so he was getting very good uh, signal-to-noise ratio. This was uh, about a six and a half magnitude star. Um, okay. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> So we don't have to use the large scopes uh, here. The smaller ones that we use, like this is, uh, uses uh, half of a $36, 50 meter, millimeter pair of binoculars. This is the mighty mini system developed by Scotty Dagenhart. 
can record stars down to a magnitude 9.5, even 10 under good conditions over about a three degree field of view with our low light level security camera. And uh, but we use other uh, t telescopes too. Um, um, the, the, we can't get as many of the mm -hmm. bigger ones on an airplane, uh, but uh, we can still uh, uh, get some, some good deployments with them, including with a 120 millimeter maxi, which gets down to 12 and a half, and the 80 millimeter MIDI, um, which uh, mm -hmm. is uh, um, 11 and a half magnitude almost. And um, we've had trouble with the maxis, and we just have a few of these, but we plan to get more. Uh, Scotty Dagenhart's uh, developed this clever mount. Uh, it's very cheap, uh, um, <laughs> ba based upon a sprinkler tripod from Sears for $30. <laughs> um, and then an EQ from uh, Orion, which is here in Altasma, and, and it worked quite well. Um, anyway, this goes back now. This is the light curve of the UNA occultation by Dennis DeKiko, the video that you saw. Um, and um, you saw this uh, in a previous talk here. so. Uh, um, but uh, I just want to mention this particular thing showing the two components and uh, you know, the separation, six mil arc seconds, plus or minus one. Um, and uh, it, it says, note that chord number one, a miss, was left off to avoid conflict. Well, I sort of take exception to that because chord one was myself <coughs> observing from Brandvoer over Vermont at about two degrees below zero. <laughs> um, but I'm not completely left out because I ran some remote stations, most of which froze up in the extreme cold, but uh, one of them worked quite well right through the center of the asteroid and got a valuable chord there at Holyoke, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, so, um, and we have uh, a number of other events. I'll just mention this with a 7.7 .7 magnitude star by the asteroid Bella that we observed on August 31st, where I was able, Joan and I were able to deploy 10 stations across central California. Um, you can see the path going down here. Um, but um, uh, w there was an uncertainty in the path. This was the predicted path. The actual path moved down here. But uh, all these stations were positive results here um, you know, with uh, um, five of my stations then recorded it, and five, four got a miss. Um, and this shows the uh, um, profile of the asteroid. I determined it a uh, possible close double. There were step reappearances were recorded at three of the stations. Um, and I'll just mention, uh, in 2003, I came over here to Maui to observe uh, another occultation of a sixth magnitude star, and uh, that was also determined to be a close double star. Um, so it's one of the ones that was published in JDSO in the uh, article by David Harold summarizing all of the observations. Um, and uh, for more information about IOTA, you can just go to our main website, www.occultations.org, and it has lists to all the other sites. So thank you. If there are any questions? <coughs>